Welcome back to the Marvel Movie Minute. I'm Kyle Olson from the Swashbuckling Ladies Debate Society podcast. And I'm Rob Cabosco. Kyle, we're we're in like a weird between time. I know. It's like yeah. a, we don't even have like a big intro or I don't even know what the music is going to be. Like I don't, we're sort of we're in that weird nebulous space between movies that I, all Marvel fans are like when they finish one and they're waiting for the next one to come out. Like who are we? Where are we? What are we doing? I hear drills and saws going in the background <laughs> as the, right. as the set for season three is being constructed. <laughs> that's right. I can still smell the paint as they're still putting all the stuff on there. I can hear birds flapping around. I wonder what that's about. <laughs> what are we doing here? What's happening? Uh, so we we missed you all. That's what it is. Yes, we missed we missed uh, having you know having a regular content coming out too. You know, like you you miss us, but we miss you too. So we want to do something in sort of in the middle here as we're as going between the two. Uh, so what we kind of wanted to do is is do a deep dive into sort of the comic lore itself to get you ready. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about stuff, but I was, this is sort of like also a. Uh, homework assignment we're, we're going to talk about the comics themselves like a new reader's guide to iron man 2 like all <laughs> here's all the pieces that were from the original comic books that are going to lead up to iron man 2 so if you wanted to be like super informed because if you're like me uh a, a geek you love you love this stuff on a very very deep level and so you want to know every possible thing you can before you go into something like that also uh it might be a way just to see like what is black widow like when she first shows up what is whiplash like when he first shows up before we actually see the cinematic versions of them you can go back and sometimes way back uh to their original comic roots and see how they originally were as opposed to how they're going to appear in the film that we're going to be discussing in scrupulous detail in the near future consider this your comic primer to season three exactly so uh so we're, we're going to go through uh some of the comics in their first appearances they're not going to do like full reviews and stuff too it's more like here's what it is here's what it's like and then go out and, and read it for yourself like i'm not we're not going to do a a full um description of every single thing that happens in there uh because it's i don't want to in- rob you of the enjoyment of uh, discovering these comics for yourself so the first question of course has to be well how the heck am i going to read these things i'm not a comic book collector i've never been to a comic store in my life what do i do well then you're, you're in the right spot because i'm going to tell you let's start from i would really like to read these things and i have no money great you, you still can because there's a wonderful thing that our friend Benjamin Franklin invented called the library. But it's pandemic times. I can't go to the library. Don't worry. We got you covered. There's a great, great service, uh, several services, I should say, that are out there that can allow you to check out digital content from the luxury of your own home. So there's two different services that, that have this. There's one is called Hoopla and one is called Overdrive. Now I I, I won't. I'm going to just use the terms interchangeably uh, because I don't know. Um, I don't know which one of them will be at your local library. But um, because uh, here in in uh, Greater Phoenix. Uh, we have one that is for uh, like our county library uses one and the Phoenix library uses a different one. So I sort of have to go back and forth between the two of them. But with your library card, you are entitled to this as well. So you can sign up for a Hoopla Overdrive account and it is free. So the nice thing about this is it's just like checking out a book. It also goes into the record, you know, in terms of like uh, a comic book. So they, when you check it out, then they get a little ting that says like, oh, people are interested in this thing. Maybe we should get more of this thing for this library. And that helps everybody. You can sign up for this, and this will download onto any device you have. If you want, if you're looking at stuff on your computer, you can do it there. You can do it on your phone. You can do it on any uh, an iPad, uh, a Galaxy Tab, uh, not uh, an Apple Watch. I don't, I don't know. Um, uh, Apple Watch probably not. Probably not. Okay, How, yeah. those screens aren't big enough. Quite enough. I don't think no. to fit the comic book panel. On iPod, it, iPod Touch. That's yeah, uh, right. I believe even Kindles. I believe can and do a lot of these. Some of them, yes. Um, uh, so, so this, this, so wherever you are, that's where you can access these things. Now, if you're saying like, okay, that's nice and stuff, but I don't like borrowing things. I like to own things. And it's like, okay. So then the next tier up, then you can go to a little place called 
Comixology. Comixology is a great resource for all these comic books. And this is actually, if you want to be able to financially support the people on there, those who are still alive, uh, and those who are, you know, their descendants are still getting this, uh, you can go and you can buy these comics on there. Unfortunately, if you're a, if you're not a fan of Amazon, well, sorry, Amazon bought them. Uh, so the money and it does go to Bezos, but some of it uh, does go to the creators of them as well. And the nice thing about it is they are super cheap because these are old comics. <laughs> you can go to Comixology, you can look up any of these things and you can buy them. And when I say you can buy them, I'm not talking five, 10, $15. I'm talking like a buck and a half. I mean, yeah, like very reasonable comics are super cheap because they're just individual issues and you'll get 22 pages of classic comic and you can, you can zoom, you can scroll in, you can screenshot, you can like, it is your comic. You can do whatever you want. Now, for um, those of you who like a physical version of this, then obviously those are still out there. Comic stores are still there. Give them your love. They need the support right now too, because uh, they've, they've been hit pretty hard by uh, all the stuff that's been going on here in uh, the wide, wide weird world. Um, so you can go and buy this conversation, but I sort of have moved away from physical comics just because I don't have that much space in my house. So I'm, I'm, I'm in the digital space. But hey, if you want to go get these, great. Give them your love. Give them your support. Um, they're out there as well. To, if you really like the feel of paper in your hand, which I can totally understand. Can I just add, um, you were the one who turned me on to Comixology. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who are listening to this just you know on the bus or whatever, it's comics, C-O-M-I-X, O-L-O-G-Y.com. Yeah. Now, I used to have a Marvel, I had the Marvel app, and I used to buy Marvel comics on my iPad from that. Mm -hmm. And that no longer really exists. You can sure. transfer that library over to Comixology. Comixology yeah. is the is the monolith now for, for digital <laughs> exactly. comics. Yeah, they, they've taken all the, like the, all the stuff from, if you bought digital comics on uh, Amazon on the Kindle store, and you bought comics on right. Comixology, and you bought comics on MarvelComics.com, all those are now one library. You just have to link them to them together, kind of like movies anywhere, just like comics anywhere. And, and I got to tell you, it's not perfect, but they have no. made it fairly easily to combine the accounts. So you don't have to worry. It's not going to have like, you're not going to have to maintain three different accounts. It'll just be under your Amazon account. Yep. So they've done a nice job on that. And the only other thing I would just say is the, the con and, and another pro is it is a little awkward. This is one of those apps that you can't actually make the purchases in the app. You actually yes. have to go to the website, make the purchase, <laughs> and then it shows up in the app anyway. True. At time That's of recording, there's actually a, a quite a war going on. Sure. Uh, all the exactly. different companies going, hey, wait a minute, how come? Apple has to take a cut of every single no, thing. No, this is and that's the through. reason why and because thirty percent. I understand. Yeah. So you you basically go to the website, you buy the stuff, and then it shows up on your device. Now the pro is these are just gorgeous. They are scans. amazing looking. They yeah. have been cleaned up. They are pristine, more pristine as we've said in the past. More mm -hmm. pristine than if you had bought this uh, this issue in 1955, yeah. right off the newsstand. It's just unbelievable how great this is. And like, yeah. you, like you said, I mean, the, the price, even if you do it on Comixology, it's not that much. And really, you will really enjoy uh, going back in time. Yeah, I mean, and, and say, I, 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 I will, <laughs> and we'll get into some more details as we talk about the individual. I will tell you that mores have changed. Uh, society is more evolved. Uh, than it was in fiction, so I, I will in not. Some I, ways, in, in other some ways, ways, I mean, yeah, there, I mean, the the on the on the high level, there is the like uh, we're we're fighting the commies, and it's like right. okay, yeah, that was a big thing at the time, and so too. But then, as they get into their depiction of women, as they get into the depiction of minorities, uh, oh, <laughs> things get a little dicier. Now, the the comics I'm going to recommend to you are, don't really get that bad, uh, but they uh, they got some issues. Beware, so, beware. these issues have issues right you could have been standing next to the press as these are we're, we're rolling off the line and they would not look as good as they do in these things so whoever is doing the, the digital rep the digital versions of these the, the scans the the coloration and stuff too you're doing a primo job i believe marvel comics unlimited has like is, is like sort of like their netflix of of comics right uh, and you can get that, and most of these, uh, I think, are part of that subscription. But I, I, I'm not a member of that, so I don't really know uh, if, like, w if these are in there or not. But so there's a lot of different ways you can get these. Uh, so let, let's let's get into it. You belong, you belong to the Mary Marvel Marching Society. March along. Well, first, what we're going to talk about is. 
Tales of Suspense number 46. Back in the uh, early times of Marvel Comics, uh, they didn't really think of the characters as being able to support their own thing. Like, you had Fantastic Four comics. You had Superman and and Batman over at the Distinguished Competition. Uh, But Marvel Comics was, there's this in the early 60s and stuff, was still making a name for itself. So even Spider-Man didn't have a Spider-Man comic. They were all part of something else because you'd have, you'd sort of like be checking in on what was going on in the universe because there's different stories going on. So the first appearance we're going to talk about here is it tells us suspense number 46. And so inside this, there are a couple different stories. Iron Man faces the Crimson Dynamo. And the cool thing about this is that this was actually written by Mr. Stan Lee himself. Yeah. Uh, and penciled and, and inked by Don Heck, another one of the, the, the greats from that time period. Like, like so if you if you know like the, the nine old men from Disney Times, these are like some of the, the nine old men from the Marvel Comics time. So but you're asking yourself, if this is Iron Man faces the Crimson Dynamo, why are we talking about this in there? Because Crimson Dynamo is not in a movie. Well, yes and no. Now, <laughs> like I said, we're not doing a deep dive onto this because I, I want I don't want to give away a lot of stuff we're gonna be talking about when we get back to the actual uh, Marvel movie minute. Let's say a lot of the plot of uh, the, the Crimson Dynamo and, and and where he comes from and his thing are very, very similar to what we're going to see with Ivan Vanko. For instance, uh, uh, when you first meet him, you live in the private laboratory of Professor Vanko. Uh, that's a familiar name. Yeah, because <laughs> they took that name and they gave it to somebody else in the movie coming up. So uh, they, they took basically roughly the story of the Crimson Dynamo and they gave it to Whiplash for the movie. Right. So a lot of the, I mean, obviously it's very 1960s, you know, you know, Tony Stark is still in the gold armor. I mean, he's, it's, it's very much of like a, uh, the evil Ruskies are, are out to steal our, our, our stuff. And this is, and the Crimson Dynamo is the Russian Iron Man. Right. Um, and, if, and if you've seen, and I'll tell you this, like I read this for the first time, you gave me the list in advance. I, I yeah. downloaded all these and read all of them. Okay. A couple things I forgot about, like, okay, this age of Iron Man, he's mm-hmm. all, like you said, all gold Yep, and he's got kind of like a mini skirt. Because <laughs> that's yeah, just the way that right. the character is drawn, and okay, so we as you talked about, uh, we're battling the communists. Mm-hmm. There's an interesting character that makes a, a cameo throughout this story, and that is uh, Nikita Khrushchev. That's right. Because yeah. like, this is this is one of the things that was great about Marvel comics, at the, and even still up to up to now, is that they're always happening now. Right. What and like whoever is the president or the premier, that is who is in the story. The difference between. Marvel and DC at the time is DC was always like, it's another world. It's, you know, it's, it's, you know, different. It's not our world. Metropolis doesn't exist in our world, that kind of stuff. But they're like, nope, New York, 1960. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I mean, John F. Kennedy is, they, they talk about being the president. I mean, like it was, right. it was always at the time it was published. That's when the story was taking place. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's very much trying to tied into what was going on in the world of the time. So it was published in October of 1963. So, wow. Yeah, so like I said, you changed. Tales of Suspense number forty six, the the Crimson Dynamo. I, I will also tell you as you're as you're purchasing these, each issue of Tales of Suspense has multiple stories in it. So if you start reading, you're like, oh, okay, I'm going to get that issue because it's a like I said, it's a buck and a half, and you're actually liking it. You're probably going to want to buy the next three or four issues because the the story continues on in there because each. Like you're only going to get about 11 pages of content or so. It's that serial format. Is like, you know, like, what will happen next? Will Iron Man survive the rage of Crimson Dynamo? Find out next issue, true believer. Uh, um, that is exactly the voice that I heard when I read every single part of this. Right? Because I mean, it really is a throwback to like the the serials of the of the times. Totally. I, I might even perform a a, a segment here, a, a panel here coming up. Oh, good. Uh, no, and also Tales of Suspense, as you get into some of these later ones, it's not just Iron Man. Like, there's, like, two episodes of two different storylines in the same issue. Yeah. So you'll see that as well and stuff. So, yeah. That's right. You're going to see some Black Panther. You're going to see some Captain America. I mean, right. like, there's all these these characters. These are all happening at the same time, too. And interesting how they interact with each other, too. So, anyway, back to the list. Okay, Tales of Suspense, volume one, number 52. 52! Shout out to my DC friend. Uh, and this is the first appearance of the Black Widow. You gotta love you gotta love the cover of this because it's a it's an action sequence. It's the Crimson Dynamo Strikes Again. Yep. And of course the title is introducing oh. yeah. Well on a sec. Why don't you do a dramatic reading 
in that voice of the entire cover because it's just it's just fantastic. Hey, it's Tales of Suspense. The Crimson Dynamo strikes again, and none but Iron Man can hope to stop him. In this issue, introducing the gorgeous new menace of the Black Widow. Dun 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 dun. <laughs> I, t- <laughs> I mean, it's I'm not kidding. That's the voice. Like yeah. I'm looking at this, and I gotta find oh, like yeah. a, a piece of stuff where it's just like you just can't get over how the way this is written. Yeah. Is totally in the vernacular of that time. Right. And one of the things that I found kind of adorable, even though after a while it got a little annoying, is <laughs> it's actually written in a way where, like, you know, Iron Man will do something and Iron Man literally will say, and now I'm going to save them because uh-huh. my suit has superpowers that actually will change the polarity of what I'm about to do. And yeah. you're like, dude, nobody t- talks like that. What are you yeah. doing? The two <laughs> things. Okay. For modern comic readers, those of you who are reading uh, comics now, to go back to here, the two things that are going to be like, whoa, to you is, first of all, thought balloons, which is sort right. of like they're going to like the characters just like having these long monologues, panel after panel of just like things they're thinking and then the second one by themselves narrating what they're doing yeah like they're like iron man in a room alone saying stuff like i need to make sure that my capacitors are at full power so they're like who are you talking to man like you don't need <laughs> well wait and you know what my favorite my third thing was in this which again this is why i got to check these out then there's the Stan Lee liner notes that just mm. pop up in a panel. Oh, yes. Where it's like, Stan Lee's like, hey, and remember from that from four episodes ago? Wink, wink. That's right, because continuity was a huge thing right. back then. And so they, and this was actually something that Stan Lee sort of came up with or like a revolution is that conversational thing where he'd be like, hey, if you want to know more about this thing, uh, go check out this issue. Like that happened in I mean, Spider Man 45, or that happened in Iron yeah. Man you know, or Tales of Suspense number four. 15 or whatever it was like and it got people to like go and try and track down those issues and thus the back issue marker was born. now i say i know dc had been doing those some of the things but the conversational tone of like hey, it's smiling stan lee and i'm here to tell you that this is the issue you need to check out like that's that's the part that was really innovative in that too is that like as you're reading it stands also there with you <laughs> you know saying this thing. and obviously he was uh, like writing a lot of these kind of things too. But even just going back through the art on some of these things is so dynamic. Like even even as as much as it like this, the sort of can be a little hokey. There's so much of this stuff was about power, like literally power, like Iron Man's suit gets depowered all the time. And he's like, like, Oh no, I'm out of power. And and, and literally he has to plug himself in. Like (laughs) he carries a, he carries an extension cord. And there's one episode, there's one moment where he's like, Hey, as I'm locked into this car, it's fortunate that I have this extension cord that I carry with me all the time. Also fortunate that there's a cigarette lighter in the back seat. Let me plug myself in. <laughs> That's right. There's one he gets captured and then left away and in one of the shows reading, uh, and he manages to plug into the light socket. Like he takes yeah. out the bulb and was, it was like, ooh, I almost because the other thing is that, uh, about this is that Tony Stark at the time, it wasn't just the arc reactor. He had to have a whole metal chest plate. Like, right. like it was all magnetized, you know, like the other stuff that kept him alive. So he had to like he was constantly wearing a metal vest all the time to keep the metal shards from, from killing him. It wasn't just like this nice glowy little spot in the middle. And also uh, secret identities like the Tony Stark is constantly dealing like like, oh, I'm not Iron Man. He's he works for me. He's no, my Iron bodyguard. Man's his, his like, bodyguard. Right. Yeah. Right. Like so nobody knows like who it actually is. So. But anyway, so we, we, we wildly digressed. Okay, so back to number 52. Uh, first appearance of the Black Widow. Nah, she doesn't do a whole lot. Like, <laughs> you would never think by reading this issue that, wow, there's one of the most dynamic characters that will come to get her own oh. movie in 2020. I mean, like, the, yeah. she's, she's just the absolute stereotype femme fatale, like, the Russian temptress there to you know, seduce the Tony Stark to get the secrets from him. I mean, no powers, no, no gadgets. No, she's just like basically just a pretty lady. And she's dressed in the same green sort of looks like a formal cocktail dress. Not even like with a, the red symbol or anything like there's no, no spider no, no, stuff no, no, to her yeah. at all. And a couple other things to note is that, well, she has a sidekick. That's true. So that's uh, totally interesting. Who's basically just a... Well, he's kind of like their version of Bane. I mean, he's just yeah. he's just muscle. Now, another thing to notice, we talked about Iron Man from this one. Already by 52, Iron Man's suit had become now the two-color uh, yep. red and gold that we're normally used to seeing and stuff, with some obviously some changes again from yeah. this period. 
Yeah, that, that's the thing that's interesting about Iron like Superman like had his look and 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 very very small changes. Uh, you, Batman, I guess, the same kind of way. But like Iron Man, constantly changing. Yeah. Like uh, like the, the one of the consistent things of Iron Man is that he's different every single time. And we're going to see that in the MCU too, because obviously we saw his first three suits in Iron Man one, and there'll right. be more suits here in Iron Man two, and and on and on and on and on and on. So yeah, one of the, the the things that was interesting is that every time sort of a new artist would take over, they wanted to do their redesign of the armor, which was not common in comics because Captain America basically looks like captain america <laughs> like right even like you know, you look at the captain america comic from now and you look at a captain america comic from his debut not that much different i mean he's he's had some stuff over the years where he's disappeared and you know like you know he's changed his stuff but that and like fantastic four there's a, a spider-man there's like certain suits that just stay and iron man is not one of the ones that just stay consistent oh yes now it's time to talk about whiplash <laughs> so uh we get to uh tales of suspense Number 97. Yeah, so this is an interesting one. Now we've moved into 1968. Stanley is still writing anymore, but now Gene Colan is penciling it. Gene Colan is one of my all-time favorite Golden Age. Uh, he just passed away a couple of years ago, and it was a big loss to all of us because he was drawing right up until the end. His work is just amazing. Like, if you go and just Google his stuff, you look at some of the comic panels, you're like, hey, okay, but like if you see before they put the inks and the, and the colors and stuff on there, like his actual just line drawings are so intricate and gorgeous. Uh, yeah, it was it was something. So uh, what was your uh, impression when you first met Whiplash? You're expecting big Russian guy with uh, tattoos and stuff, too. And uh, that's not exactly what this Whiplash is like. No, uh, this Whiplash is <laughs> is just a large dude. In a, he's like uh, the third member of the Wonder Twins. Wonder Twin powers activate! <laughs> <laughs> With a whip, dude. Like, yeah. what is the? Let me tell you, this is one of those examples of the MCU version <laughs> is far, I mean, really, honestly, is far more developed and makes more sense than this. Yeah, because uh, there's a couple things that are different. First of all, uh, I mean, obviously, it's a comic book, so he has a full costume. Can, sure. can you describe... Uh, like what his costume looks like as we're used to seeing Iron Man 2 Mickey Rourke and like the oh. tats with the thing or the even like the the big suit at the end of the movie what is what is this whiplash oh, look oh, like? oh no like like I said Wonder Twins he's wearing purple tights yep. like from neck to toe with with actually a cowl just a simple cowl over it and then he's got orange boots mm -hmm. an orange cape orange gloves an orange cummerbund with a <laughs> with a back skirt <laughs> uh -huh. and a nice big coif of red hair sticking That's out of the top right. of his cowl. <laughs> and and also uh, not Russian. No. <laughs> uh, he is uh, Italian-American, uh, and he works for the mob. Yeah, what? <laughs> Because he's he got a is, boss. That's the big. Yeah, there's not a big. There's no reveal yeah. in this. In this and issue. It, that's right. The, the boss. His boss is the leader of the Magia. Magia is the it was the mafia. Leave the gun. Take the cannoli. Of okay. the Marvel Universe, and they, they didn't want to use Mafia because they, they lived in New York, too. They didn't want to make anybody angry, so they invented the Magia. That's how I pronounce it. I don't know if that's how if you pronounce nice. it, because it's mostly written. Uh, and so that was their version of the mob, and they were led by the Big M. Oh, Stan Lee. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, and so the Whiplash is just a schmo. Like, he's, ju he's just like an enforcer. He's just a guy. Like, if you decide to get this, and I, and I highly recommend it, because it actually is a really, it's a pretty good issue. Like, oh, it's the, very entertaining. The this is the next two. Great. Yes, absolutely. And, like, Iron Man is on his back the whole time. I mean, like, he is really, like, struggling this whole thing. Like, he's really having a hard time with this, too. But... Uh, Whiplash doesn't do anything in this issue. <laughs> like he shows right. up and it's like, there's Whiplash, and yes, he has a whip. That's pretty much it. He doesn't actually fight Iron Man until the next issue. So make sure you pick up 98 and probably 99 because the fight continues on. Oh. He really is just a mob enforcer. So the one thing to add to on this is, is now when you look at the images of this M, this mysterious character, mm -hmm. it, it's in the shadows, you kind of can tell that he's not human, or at least doesn't appear to be human. Mm. So I thought that was interesting. And the other big thing foreshadowing a later episode, a later movie in the MCU, mm -hmm. we are meeting a member of the Stark family of a name that will become familiar to fans True. of the MCU, which is the his cousin, right? Yep, his cousin. His, he, has, he has sort of like a... I kind of got a Jimmy Olsen vibe from this. He sort of has like this, uh, this sort of like schlubby, non, like this uh, ne'er do well, always trying to get rich quick kind right. of guy that he has to end up, you know, bailing out from the situation. And his name 
is Morgan Stark. So we know that the names have been again, like you know, they a lot of inspiration, obviously, for the latter part of the MCU comes from these from these. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, now, and and also there's a uh, Shield agent that's helping yes. him out too, a like a, a forthright, you know, good guy, like trying to do his best. He's he has his own side mission, trying to to help him uh, and sell Iron Man. And of course, what more respectable a Shield agent could there be than Mister Jasper Sitwell? <laughs> what now what's his what's the character's deal there i don't know like he, he really is in this just seems like a, a forthright dude now the jasper sitwell we know in the mcu would later go on to be you know serving a much darker purpose uh but in this he's he's blonde haired blue eyed you know snappy dresser with his bow tie like he's, he's got a, freckles and yeah. a little horn grim glasses yeah. and he's just here i am here to yeah. save the day what yeah I exactly do? Oh. Yeah, it's it, interesting how these sort of the names have come around. And so Whiplash, yeah, obviously has changed a lot. This, I, I believe, the Whiplash that I was reading when he shows back up because he he is a, a constant foil for Iron Man as he goes through. Is Whiplash two? Like I think somebody else takes over. But the thing that always changed, not only did not always have the whip, but also that shock of hair out the top of his mask. Like it, later, later it's green. It's like a green mohawk. Oh, okay. But okay. every time Whiplash shows up, that is uh, always a part of his costume, is having that shock of hair out the top, which doesn't really happen in Iron Man 2. So yeah, so Tales of Suspense, number 97. The next issue, 98, actually has Captain America on the cover, but Captain America fighting Black Panther. I mean, nothing wrong with that. Yeah, that's a great little uh, story. Yeah, it's a fun little side story, too. Hey, I just want to add a little thing here as I was reading these. Yeah. The guy who does the lettering, Artie Simic, can you imagine writing all this out? <laughs> There's no uh, InDesign. There's no, there's no Illustrator. Like yeah, you're yeah, writing no, all this out. And also when they're they're drawing, there a lot of times they're they're having like the artists have to draw the word bubbles too. I mean, like it used to be that you would put them on later, but back yeah. at this time they had to like because inc- when you're designing the the look, you know that you have the the page in front of you as an artist, you have to have the characters doing something dynamic and know that you're gonna have huge space and you're it covered up with them talking. Because I mean, obviously back at this time they were very chatty. Yeah. Oh yeah. Because I mean, no, like yeah, and, like there's word bubbles, there's sound effects, there's dialogue, and then there's also like the little Stanley aside. And we see a cameo of not necessarily a character, but a vehicle, which That's I was right. surprised to see the helicarrier, right. the shield helicarrier. Yeah, all the way back from then. Obviously, very different design than what we're used to, but. Very clearly, that's what it is. And a different Nick Fury. That's right. A much whiter Nick Fury, because the Nick Fury from the uh, from the comics is a white dude. A cross between Jacques Cousteau and Johnny Quest. Uh, the characters yep. in there with the big, like, he's got like a turtleneck like a big bushy turtleneck sweater on and just, <laughs> yeah. I just kind of got a vibe of that. I don't know why that's again, yep. crazy pull, but I actually, uh, I, I would say he's much, he's very James Bond influenced. I say at this point. Oh yeah, sure. That, no, he that was, cause well. he was the James, he's really is the James Bond of right. the MCU. And then just ridiculousness. There's a, there's a, a thing in here. With <laughs> yeah, all there's, the girlfriends, there's all the girlfriends all these show up. Oh yeah, exactly. For- all the girlfriends. So Stony Stark apparently has like multiple girlfriends and they're all, they're all apparently cool with it, which, Hey, yeah. swing in sixties, baby. Yeah, baby. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a line. <laughs> you gotta just say, there's a line here where they all show up. The shield guy is all, of course, like, what are you doing? And uh, we happen to be his girlfriends, and he's like, all of you? And the one girl's like, of course not. And then another one adds in, most of the others couldn't come. (laughs) And you're like, good God. Jeez. And then who's the mystery? There is the mystery girl. Who they who they allude to, but then never. This doesn't get resolved. Is there? A story? I don't know. Tony Stark has had a lot of girlfriends over the course yeah. of time, so I honestly do not know where this goes because uh, he has they they come and go right throughout the course of the the issue. So yeah, I don't know. So they have their fight, and then this wraps up. The storyline wraps up in issue ninety nine. Yep, at the mercy of the Magia. I want to say it's Magia. Magia. I, I okay. Don't know. Nah. I say, I, it's like I say, I've seen it written a thousand times, but I've never heard it spoken out loud. So I'm um, just taking a shot. Okay, so really funny thing I did notice in this, though, when I was reading these. Yeah. Did you notice the Iron Man suit changes during the course of this story? <laughs> yeah. It's yeah, it's, it's interesting to see. Like, And also, part of that also is 
the coloration. I mean, like, cause yes. obviously, the, you, know, you know, Gene Colan draws it and then somebody else comes through and does afterwards. There's, there's been a long history of like over enthusiastic colorists really wrecking art. Sure. Like, oh, cause sure. Like, not understanding what something was. And like suddenly somebody's armor or leg changes color because they assume it's from a different person. Like they didn't understand anybody, the any one of us who grew up with paint by numbers <laughs> and you messed up. And then later on you realize, oh, I messed oh, up. Oh, no. Yeah. yeah. You know what happened. Yeah. This is pretty good. They have a good battle. We have this great sequence that just made me laugh about Sitwell is uh, getting into his fast car and he's having that whole like inner dialogue that you're talking about that we talked mm -hmm. about earlier. Yeah. I mean, this just cracked me up because he's literally in the car and he's like, now is the time when my cool appraisal of the situation must be most astute. Now is the time when, and he gets interrupted. He's like having this conversation <laughs> and Fury comes on and he's like, yeah, now's the time when you better answer the communication Sitwell. Like, I think we take this for granted when you think about the transformation that these storylines take in the in movie, yeah. because of great acting, because of great storytelling, you get to tell all those things without saying a word. So I think that's all. So I, I, I've, as we're as we're going through, I, I realized I had also pulled out a couple of things too. This is what I love about Stan Lee. So there is a a B roll of Morgan Stark. There's a there's a B plot all the way through. Oh, so right. and and Jasper Sitwell too. So Jasper, they're having their own sort of side adventure almost as it's going through. So there's there's like multiple pages of this, and it's. There's, they're not superheroes. They're not doing. Anything. They're like they're basically just like playing poker and ha I mean like and like you know infiltrating this group or whatever. So there's there's a big yellow balloon that pops up in the middle of the, the thing and pointed down. It says, "But now before you decide, this is a tryout issue of Super Sitwell Comics. Let's cut back to very person Jasper is hoping to find and to an enraged Whiplash recovering from the fallen Iron Man's repulsor ray blast." <laughs> Like, even in 1968, he was playing with the form. Like, he was, you know, Stan was right there with you. Like, tell, even though he's the one who wrote all that stuff, he's also the one being like, eh, you Is know, it like, okay, okay but okay, when I saw that, I'm glad you pointed that out. Because I kind of left, because I was like, it's almost like, you know, as they're doing this, they're like, they get to like halfway on the page, and he's yeah. like, oh, wow, we really spent a lot of time on this. Uh -huh. We better tell the audience, hey. Yeah. Look, we know. We know. <laughs> That's pretty great. Uh, yeah, this I is totally that. where it's so great that we'd really encourage you to check yeah. this out. Because... I tell you, you, I, you will definitely get a dollar and a half's worth of entertainment out of it. Oh, I my guarantee. God. Com completely. No, these, this is really great to see. Uh, yeah, so at the end of end of that, we have when Black Widow is she's leaving. Uh, I found another panel I had pulled too. Uh, it says, Yet what of the beautiful, dangerously irresistible Black Widow? She is still at large on some fog-filled street in some crowded city, yes, lonely, yeah. abandoned, always hiding. Her constant companion? Fear. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> oh, <laughs> boy. Yeah, it's good stuff. Okay, what's... Uh, oh, yeah, so... That's, okay, so that's... For classic comics, that's 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 sort of done. So, like, that, well, we're going to get into a couple of more modern stuff here. So... In when the MCU first hit and, and got super popular and stuff too, they were like, "Hey, we should maybe write comics about that too." So they actually are a series of comics that came out in and around all of the proper Marvel Cinematic Universe stories. The interesting thing about these is supposedly they are in canon. So the things that happen in these comics apparently are the things that officially happened in the MCU. Your mileage may vary. But it's interesting to see them try and incorporate comic book sort of style and logic into this. Do you know what uh, I have to say to that? What? Thanks, JJ. <laughs> because no, like, right? I think this became a thing when JJ started doing when he rebooted Star Trek. Hmm, and they okay. had the whole countdown and there was a oh, whole bunch of true. comics that were absolutely with canon in canon, and they were to tell you to set up the movie. That's the vibe I got when I read these. Hmm. Yeah. So there's there's two that we're going to talk about here, and was, there's a lot of them, uh, but there's two that we're going to talk about here, and one of them is called Fury's Big Week. Now, if you were following along and you haven't watched the rest of the, the MCU and you're just following MCU just by us, first of all, really? And, right. and thanks? Yeah, I uh, appreciate that. So, this, the, so if you read Fury's Big Week, It'll be full of spoilers. But the cool thing about A Fury's Big Week is that it shows how everything connects chronologically. So it's it starts out with like you know, basically Captain America, like you know, when he's playing graduate, but it takes elements of Captain America 
and Iron Man 2 and Thor and Incredible Hulk and some of the post credit scenes into Avengers and ties them all together. Incredible Hulk, Iron Man 2, and Thor are happening at the same time, and according to this comic, are all happening within the same seven days. So this comic is about Nick Fury going from place to place and following all these things along, and so you get to see where he was before he meets up with Tony Stark in at the donut shop in Iron Man 2 and then you get to see where he goes afterwards and you can see what where Coulson was doing you can see what what Natasha was doing before she got the assignment to go and you know infiltrate Tony Stark's inner circle as as Natalie which by uh, the way and well not a spoiler because you've already listened to season 2 yeah she's at Culver University yeah like according to <laughs> this, according to this, which as they say is canon, she yes. was at Culver University uh, as part of those ages, like you know, to to monitor what was going on with the yeah, home. no, totally, yeah. So it, it's interesting. Um, the artwork is actually actually pretty good. Like it, 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 they actually have multiple artists that that go all the way through. It's well, the same writers, but multiple artists. Um, uh, and so it's 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 fun. Like I mean, obviously, if, like you say, there's there potentially are spoilers. You know, sure. for, for if you haven't seen all the other MC, if you watch the Avengers and stuff yet, but it's a fun way of like sort of uh, you know seeing it from their perspective, and you can tell some sometimes they're better at getting the uh, the the likenesses of the the famous people <laughs> better than others. But Christopher Yost is actually a a, a serious talent. He actually worked on the uh, animated series. He worked on uh, X Men Evolution. Uh, and a bunch of other of the animated series uh, before he got made his uh, big mark in comics. So he's got some some creds behind him. I did get a little bit of the video game vibe out of this in mm-hmm. terms of likenesses. You know, they're a little, yeah. it's, just, it's off. I mean, slightly obviously. off. Yeah, exactly. And, and because there are multiple artists through the thing too, like you, you, you suddenly turn the page and it's like, whoa, hold on. Who's that? Like, it's like, oh, that's that. This is and this artist's interpretation of Natasha Romanoff. So, so that's a lot of fun. And then the one that's, uh, so that's, that's, that's Fury. I think it's called the official title, I believe is Marvel's Avengers Prelude. Fury's Big Week, but if you just right. look for Fury's Big Week, go find it. This is this is a collection of I think six or eight sort of smaller comics. So it's it'll, those, this is back a couple of bucks. It's actually eight episodes. It, it is eight ish. episodes. Okay, yeah. uh, but I'll tell you something. It's worth it because I enjoyed this again. I had not read this before. Yeah, I loved all the little things that it filled in. Mm-hmm. Like, how did this person get here at the beginning of this movie? Again, this is all kind of like up until the, the Avengers, the first Avengers movie, which Correct. is what it leads into. And it, you just really enjoy it. Like, it does. It answers a lot of questions. By the way, for those of you who are fans of season two, the mm-hmm. Abomination is in it, and he is green. <laughs> might I just add? So, mm-hmm. and, and it is just, oh, and it's funny. The, 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 I think what you really get at this, if you're a Black Widow fan, mm-hmm. this makes Black Widow into a truly Forrest Gump character. For the yes. first phase of the MCU. That's right. Yeah, she She's was everywhere. everywhere. <laughs> like, it's really actually kind of funny. And, and changes her hairstyle and pretty oh, much every time you see oh, it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and if you have listened to us talk about uh, General Ross, mm-hmm. definitely provides more understanding of General Ross. Yeah, and how it ties in with S.H.I.E.L.D. and, and all that stuff. So, yeah, it's that, that's a fun read. Uh, yeah, because uh, apparently, like, she was the one that found Stearns afterwards after his yes. accident. And, right. Yeah. So definitely, yeah, definitely check yeah, that that's out. that's a good one. And then uh, I think next in this sort of series is they actually did a prelude comic uh, that was supposed to be in Canada, right, leading you up to the events of Iron Man. So like, essentially what this issue, this, this episode is doing, <laughs> getting you ready for Iron Man 2. Right. And so that was called Iron Man 2 Public Identity. And the cool thing about this is it was written by two guys, Joe Casey, who is a, a serious comic talent who has written thousands of issues of, of stuff and Justin Thoreau. Now that name will be important to you because he is the screenwriter of Iron Man 2, the sole credited screenwriter of Iron Man 2. So the two of them together wrote this prelude. Now I would say this comic is, is more interesting than good. So I, there are, I would agree. <laughs> there are three issues of this because I believe this had to be written and drawn before the movie was done. The likenesses are wildly inaccurate. Oh yeah, like, totally. Totally. <laughs> uh, so it's it's just it's sort of like uh it's bridging the gap between Iron Man and Iron Man 2 about what happened in the middle and sort of adding more action and adventure and uh you know we see Jarvis is actually a, a person, I believe right. they go there because they do a flashback to right. Howard to, to Howard. Right. Um, 
Uh, we see General Ross. I mean, like it, there's there's uh, Coulson's in it. I mean, like it's it's all the sort of the elements. And yeah, it's uh it's an interesting read. <laughs> uh, like I say, I wouldn't put it in and go like, oh man, this was I'm so fantastic. I loved it. It's like mm, it was a uh, it was a comic that happened, uh, and people got paid to it, <laughs> draw and write it. And, now it's okay. <laughs> it is. Again, because I like this movie so much, yeah. it, it made me happy because I was like, oh, I can kind of see now what some of the motivations motivations are of like Rhodey. You'll understand more about his Iron Man and Tony's sort of standoffishness with the senator who who will appear yes. and we'll talk about in, in Iron Man 2. Yeah. That is explained, obviously, given given a lot more understanding of what's going on in that relationship and why there's animosity. Yeah, and Justin Hammer looks nothing like Sam Rockwell. No, totally not. <laughs> Multiple times you have to look, and yeah, and, and, and Don Cheadle and, and uh, does not look like Don Cheadle. Yeah, I mean, there's I, so at, at this point, I don't know if they were even allowed to because there's a whole right. weird likeness rights thing. They just had to be like, uh, he's uh, Tony Stark, so just uh, put a guy and then put a mustache and goatee on him, and now he's Tony Stark. Right. Yeah, I don't know, but. It's yeah, like I said, it's it's interesting in, in terms of like if you really want to see like the whole story, uh, but uh, I say I wouldn't. I would I would much rather you uh, if you if you have a limited budget, eh, go back into the classic ones and buy some more of those. Oh, you, you really will, want you to. will enjoy yourself as you're it's talking more. in your 1950s radio yeah. announcer voice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hey, true believers. Uh, so then, I said the last one that we're going to talk about uh, for this uh, is the probably the one that's the most directly relevant to the movie, and that is, of course, Iron Man, Demon in a Bottle. So Demon in a Bottle was a story arc that went over, let's see, I think it's eight issues. Yeah, it published, uh, let's say, say, from issue 120 to 128. This was published in 1979. Um, so obviously now we're into Iron Man is fully on in his own comic, and I've actually had, already by this point, had 120 issues. So that's you know, one a month. So we, he'd been going for quite a while by this point. Written by David Micheline and Bob Layton, and illustrated by the great John Romita Jr. John Romita Jr. is another one of those in the pantheon of, of amazing. His father, actually, John Romita, is, and was a great uh, artist as well, and John Romita Jr. still out there, still doing fantastic stuff. I, he was one of the first comic artists I ever met, and I was actually too intimidated to talk to him. So I just <laughs> stood there like an idiot as he did a sketch for me. <laughs> stood dead silent, like, thank you, sir. And like, and I was a grown man. So uh, that's, that's how much his, his art has sort of meant to me. So say probably the most famous storyline of Iron Man. Like this is when people look at this is the one. Like Batman has a bunch of famous ones, but Iron Man doesn't have a lot of great story arcs that people know. Uh, and this is one of the few ones. And Justin Hammer first shows up in this. I mean, like, there's a lot of a lot of stuff going on. Namor is a big deal. I, Namor's fascinating to me because Namor is one of those characters that was a gigantic comic book character that was beloved and has never really translated well to any other medium. He was one of like up there in the the Marvel pantheon of like I keep saying that word. I don't know why that keeps coming up. So like you had Captain America and Spider Man and Iron Man and and Namor and Silver Surfer. Like they were all yeah. up there as major major characters. He has never really done well outside of a comic book he's still around he's still a, a major character he doesn't have his own book right now but he's still a major force inside of the marvel comic universe uh but like boy he i mean he, him showing up in an issue was a big deal like oh man namor and like right. but in every comic every video game even the cartoon like he never people just go eh just like an Echo Man thing. I was like, yeah, but <laughs> he's not really, but yeah. It's, it, so it's, but so he, he, the first couple of issues of this are, are uh, Namor and uh, Iron Man sort of, uh, of course, in the classic Marvel tradition of like, we're both heroes. We disagree about something. Let's fight. What it comes down to uh, in, in the model is about basically Tony Stark's alcoholism. And in 1979, in a comic book, this was a big deal. Like they just didn't really talk about this kind of stuff. So Tony, like his armor is sort of taken over by hammer through various machinations and the armor quote unquote ends up killing someone. And then he's blamed for it. He goes into a downward spiral of this and ends up, you know, basically crawling into the bottle and really loses himself in, you know, getting drunk all the time and then drunk and in charge of the armor. And like, it really gets to a dark place before he sort of, finds that hero within and, and then and then brings himself back out and then is able to sort of get himself back to be the hero that he needs to be and 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 from that point he was an alcoholic all the way through i mean like they they have that is something that has stayed with the character like he has been in recovery uh ever since which is 
kind of impressive for a comic book to be uh, covering over. And, and Whiplash actually shows up in, in the course of these things as well, still wearing his... Uh, is a purple and orange uh, ensemble. I, I will warn you, uh, for the as, for those of you who are <laughs> of more sense of nature, um, they they reboot his origin in this. Uh, and they instead of it used to be that he was like the, his stuff had happened during I think it was Korea when his uh, the character first created. That was like where he had the accident stuff too. They then this comic moves it to Vietnam. Right. And their depiction of the evil Vietnamese is not the most enlightened. No. <laughs> so no. just so you know, like I'm not defending that. I'm just saying be aware of it as you're getting into it. But what would well, you want to say? And, and I was going to say is, you know, considering where this is, late 70s, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, some of this stuff is not certainly as sensitive as our as our current sensibilities are. So, you know, obviously keep that in mind. But also the dealing with like the alcoholism, you know, that is – we, if you were a child of the 70s and eight, in early 80s, those would always be – dealt with even in sitcoms mm -hmm. you know there was there was a whole run of about four or five years in american television where you were dealing with real serious issues in the middle of like different strokes and facts of life and so even happy days right like you'd have yeah. all of that so i think the comic i think the comic industry as you said i mean i think that was part of that that was part of something that was just in the vernacular of our culture at the time yeah uh, so you had that but interesting how i think knowing what i knew even knew of the iron man character I always wondered if you were going to deal with this in the MCU as you're as you're in the infancy of this still the third movie. How are you going to deal with that? I think it's interesting to see how they dealt with it, as we will talk about yeah. in season three. Yeah, in that you don't want to you don't want to go too far because then that I mean then really what does these movies now become about addiction in that way, right? And right. And I don't know how you do that early on in this when you're trying to make this happen, but you're also dealing with much more serious serious topics. If someday if we ever get to a, a, a season, who knows? on Ant-Man, you know, there would be more ridiculous things to talk about with Hank Pym yes. in that, oh, and how yes. he's been depicted in the comics and how that was changed for the better. Yes. Uh, but you still, you know, you don't want you don't want to just bury some of these, these real serious issues. I think uh, when you look at the source material and you see how it's actually turned out, I think they did a really good job. Yeah. And this, this is one of the, the strengths of, of uh, you know, Stan Lee's legacy right. uh, is that he was not afraid to, to take on this, to, to, to acknowledge that these things existed, that, you know, that these, his, the heroes had real problems. This is the whole hero with feet of clay thing is that like they struggled with addiction. They struggled with, you know, real, real problems. And so Iron Man, like as it was even back in our road to infinity days, when I talked about Iron Man, the thing that was cool about Iron Man when he first showed up is he was a grown man. Like, that was not the normal thing. I mean, Batman had a thing happen to him when he was a child and sort of never grew past that. Right. Uh, you know, Superman obviously came from a different, you know, a world and stuff too. But, like, the, the when Tony Stark becomes Iron Man, he is a adult. And that was, like, not a common thing. There's so many, you know, teen sidekicks and, you know, you know a small kids and and uh, that you know like basically young people who would basically like, get power and then off they went like captain america was a young like by the time you know um steve rogers became captain america he was 18 maybe right. I, mean, oh, I think he was right. even younger than right. that i mean like you know he was a he was you know like essentially like a a young person but tony stark wasn't tony stark had had a full life by the time he got to be Iron Man, and that was a huge difference. And so, this is an adult character dealing with an adult issue, you know. But still, in a comic book where a guy puts on Iron Man, and fights a villain named the Melter, you know. I mean, <laughs> so it was an interesting mix. So, like I said, like I said some of it hasn't uh, aged incredibly well, uh, but I, I still think it's worth it. And, and this is the closest we'll ever get to this because because it's such a serious topic. Oh yeah, that oh, the absolutely. MCU is just not built for the for this kind of you know, in depth sort of like uh, somebody made the joke about like, we're never going to see the Iron Man version of leaving Las Vegas. <laughs> no, it's just not going to happen. Like it just, no, you know. that's not happening. Yeah. No. Yeah. Well, then again. <laughs> no. So, so there you go. So that, that that's our, our abbreviated list. Obviously, you know, it's comics. There's, there's hundreds and hundreds of issues, all that kind of stuff. And so um, these are just the sort of, you know, four or five that we picked out that are sort of directly referenced or, or important to what's going to be coming up in uh, Iron Man two, as we do our deep dive in there. And, and I apologize if during the course, I reiterate some of the things that we've said here today, <laughs> but think of it as, you know, bonus 
Like oh, you're, no, already, this is... you're getting a little sneak preview of the things we're going to be talking about oh. when we dig deep into Iron Man 2. No, absolutely. And again, we thought this was really important to do the primer so that you could spend some time and find some of these issues and, and check them out. And I think when you go along the journey of season three, you're going to be you're going to be that more enlightened and laugh more at our jokes. I don't know, either so. way. Yeah, yeah. We hope so. And, and so it'll fill the time while you're waiting for us to start publishing uh, regular issues or episodes yes. of uh, Iron Man 2 from the Marvel Movie Minute. So that's our list. Uh, you know, if you have more things that you think uh, should be on there, let us know. We're on all the social things. You can hit us up on Twitter. We have our Marvel Movie Minute Next Real Film Podcast Executive Lounge over on Facebook. We are on the Discord, so nextreel.com slash Discord. Uh, all, we have our own dedicated Marvel Movie Minute channel, uh, which you can post stuff up there. Uh, let's get some comic book discussion going, people. Um, can't just all be about movies, right? We'll be back here in uh, a short time uh, to talk about uh, Iron Man Two when we start uh, doing our regular issues. So hopefully this was a nice way to bide the time while you're waiting for those things to start. Um, happy reading, and we will see you uh, in the future. Until next time, true believers. Bye. <laughs>